بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد uh, continuing the station of الخلق manners or I should say characteristics um, أبو إسماعيل رحمه الله تعالى says قال صاحب المنازل الخلق ما يرجع إليه المتكلف من نعته the uh, خلق um, and you know you can accurately translate the word as manners uh, because obviously when we say akhlaq it's referring to manners uh, but there's also another word adab which is also a station that is upcoming um, i think adab is a more accurate word for manners whereas khuluq it's more about characteristics good characteristics and abu ismail here defines khuluq as what uh, certain attributes that go back to the person okay um, and he uses the word al uh, that the one who is responsible religiously responsible has these attributes and perhaps using the word mutakallif here is to allude to the fact that these characteristics don't come about naturally or I mean, that's not the best way of wording it. These characteristics or these attributes can only come about through a, a consistent and persistent uh, application of them. Okay, so uh, using also using the word not is like an attribute indicates that the, the behavior, the manner that this person is applying isn't something that is a one-time thing or every now and then, but rather it has become part of that person to the extent that we can consider a characteristic of his or hers. <clears throat> okay, to kind of reframe this. If I were to meet someone and greet them, say hello, how are you, how's your day, and smile to them, I am behaving with manners. I am acting according to adab. However, doing that does not necessarily mean that I am a, let's say, a kind person. In other words, behaving with manners in one particular incident does not indicate that that manner is a characteristic of the person. Again, let me try and reword this. I meet someone and I interact with that person using kindness. Okay, so for that meeting, that one meeting for an hour or so, I behaved, my manners were the manners of kindness. Now, just because I behaved with kindness in this particular setting is not enough to indicate that I am a kind person, right? How many people, or maybe you know someone who, when they're with a certain group, they're smiling, they're happy, they're easygoing, they're generous, but when they go back to their family, they are just nakdeen, as we say in Arabic. They're just a grumpy person. Right? So, you know, with one, in one group, they act with a certain manner. But with another group, they act with a completely contrary manner. So it shows you that manners are different than characteristics. Or just because someone behaves with a certain manner does not make it one of their characteristics. So when we talk about khuluq, right? Khuluq is talk is referring to manners that have become part of the person's character. So notice that the word khuluq right, comes from the word khalaq. They're from the same root. And khalq is a creation. Whereas khuluq is a manner uh, or a, a characteristic. Why are they coming from this to, to from the same root? Perhaps that is showing us that like a creation retains a certain form, right? For example, this is a created entity, this water bottle, okay? It's a created entity. And because it's created, it is makhluq, we assume that it's going to retain the same form until some external force comes and changes it, right? But the idea is that being a makhluq it retains a particular form and it has certain characteristics, certain attributes. It's transparent, it can hold water, um, you know, there's a little bit of rubber here. You can use this as, you know, there are certain characteristics and no matter how long or 
for a long time it will retain these characteristics. So similarly, Cholok is the are attributes that the person retains. It becomes normal behavior of theirs. So giving charity once is good. But giving charity once does not mean that the person is a generous person. It is only after the person puts a lot of effort in giving and being generous can we call this person a generous person. Likewise, it becomes to the extent that it's almost natural that the person behaves with generosity. Right? It's not something, it has become so rooted and so ingrained in the person's mind and heart, so ingrained in their character that it comes naturally. When an opportunity comes, they don't sit and think, should I be generous or should I not be generous? It's almost natural that the body is, the person is kind of pushing him or herself to act generously. That is khuluq. And the Prophet ﷺ says that when you look at yourself in the mirror, right, say, Allahumma kama jammalta khalqi fa jammil khuluqi. Oh Allah, as you have beautified my, my uh, physical form, you know, how you created me, you created me with beauty, then beautify my khuluq, beautify my characteristics. Okay? Uh, so uh, it's important to make this, this, this differentiation. Akhlaq is a higher level than adab. But um, a person must have adab in order to be someone of akhlaq. But a person who behaves in adab does not mean it's part of their khuluq. I hope that makes sense. Okay. And Abu Sama'i then says, وَاجْتَمَعَتْ كَلِمَةُ النَّاطِقِينَ فِي هَذَا الْعِلْمِ أَنَّ التَّصَوُّفَ هُوَ الْخُلُقِ He says that the, the scholars of spirituality, the scholars of tazkiyah, have all agreed. There's consensus among them that at tasawwuf Sufism, is synonymous with good characteristics. In other words, the primary purpose of tasawwuf is to better your manners. And so when we look at the history of tasawwuf, when you look at the very early you know, scholars who Sufism goes back to, you find that there are two primary goals. One is what Abu Ismail points to here, perfecting our character, perfecting our manners, building and engaging these manners to where they become part of us, a characteristic of ours. The second primary goal is to build ikhlas, sincerity. These are the two purposes of tasawwuf. Now, of course, as the years went by, Tasawwuf branched out into a thousand different branches. Some retained this initial goal while others completely changed it. It's more about you know, a cult following and glorifying the Shaykh and karamat and blessings and all this nonsense. Right. Um, but Abu Ismail ta'ala, is one of the early uh, Sufi, I guess not too early, but nonetheless he is one of those who seems to have retained the initial goal, the initial purpose for which Sufism was developed as an uh, independent science. So the whole, when we look through all of this, if you remember all of these stations that we've gone by, and you really ask yourself the question, how do these stations fit under the concept of khuluq, you can find how. Because once we get to the station of adab, Abu Ismail points to the fact that Part of adab, part of manners, is manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we spoke about az-zuhud, asceticism, and we spoke about raja, hope, and we spoke about ikhlas, sincerity, all of these are forms of adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are manners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Um, so all of what we have gone through hopefully has been working to develop our manners, to where they become more than just practiced manners, but rather part of our character, who we are. It becomes defining of who we are as individuals. And all 
all literature, all research, all books that engage the topic of akhlaq, of uh, uh, character, uh, or uh, well, how did I say it? Good character uh, revolves around one center point, and that is doing good and refraining from harming other people. So it's really interesting how he defines it here, or how he kind of uh, assesses what akhlaq is in a, in a kind of thesis, very summarized way. Uh, because what's interesting about it is that um, when you look at all of the sharia, the scholars have summarized all of the sharia as having the following goal. Jalbu al-maslaha wa daf'u al-mafsada. Bringing what is in our best interest, bringing it about, and deflecting that which is harmful. So you find the same definition when it comes to akhlaq. Also, the concept of al-amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi an munkar commanding good or encouraging good and discouraging evil. It goes around this idea. And so akhlaq is the same thing. Now, how can we make this definition into a little bit more practical way? How can we see it more practically? And it's the following. What is good character? If you have, right, you are in a situation, you're in a scenario, you're dealing with someone, and you want to be good in character when you deal with that person regardless of who that person is, whether they're a good person, a bad person, whatever it is. Um, but you have all this information. Should I act with this or with that? Or should I do this and should I do that? And perhaps each and every one of them, you see how there is a reason to behave according to that. But you don't know what, which one to choose, what is most pleasing to Allah. Well, perhaps you can ask yourself the question, which of these will bring about the good and will and or will um, restrict the harm. What can I do? How can I behave to bring good to this person and protect him or her from harm? This is pretty much the pract a pract this is very a very practical definition of akhlaq. And then he continues to say, yudriku imkan dhalik fi ashya. He says that the way we can achieve this, meaning achieve akhlaq is through three things. Fil'ilm, waljud, wassabir. These are the three. How do we achieve good akhlaq, good characteristics? First, with knowledge. Second, with generosity. And third, with patience. Right? How so? Why these three things? Well, knowledge teaches us the good, what is good and what is bad. So if Abu Ismail is defining akhlaq or summarizing akhlaq as bringing good, doing good, and restricting the bad, well, what is good and what is bad? How do we know that this is good and that is bad? That requires knowledge. It requires knowledge. Because remember, when we say good and we say bad, we as Muslims aren't going to define these two words according to our own personal opinion. We're going to define it according to Quran and Sunnah. What is good to a Muslim is what Allah has deemed good. And what is bad to a Muslim is what Allah has deemed bad. Right? Now the Sharia doesn't have an opinion on every single thing in life. But if it does, that's what, that's what we want to know. And so in order to have good akhlaq, we as Muslims do not kind of rationally put together what is good akhlaq, but rather we seek that guidance from Quran and Sunnah, from Quran and Hadith. That is where we go to understand what is good and what is bad. And therefore, knowledge is integral to good akhlaq. And I've been repeating this so much over the past few uh, sessions. These scholars spent an equal, if not more time, learning about akhlaq as they did learning about Islam and the, the religious sciences. And again, this is one of the clear differences between Islam or education in Islam and throughout Islamic history versus modern forms and modern uh, curriculums of 
uh, of, uh, of uh, education. Akhlaq was an integral part of education back in the day. Whereas today, I mean, I don't think there's a class about manners, meaning how to, what are good manners and whatnot. Um, so, I mean, we really need to take this to heart and understand that good manners isn't simply, you know, getting lucky and having parents who teach you good manners. Good manners is a endeavor that you need to pursue independently. You know, if we have parents who taught us good manners, that is a huge blessing, a huge blessing. But it doesn't stop there. We need to go on, continue, and learn about what is good and what is bad, and how to perform good and how to perform bad. Right? And, and the resources for that are, as I said, Quran and Hadith. So knowledge. To achieve good manners, good characteristics, we need to have knowledge. We need to learn about it. Um, number two, al jud generosity. Now, when we think of generosity, in our mindset today, the first thing that comes to mind is what? Money, giving money. And no doubt that is part of good manners. No, no doubt that is part of generosity. But the way Ibn Qayyim, rahmatullah alayhi, um, the way he sees Jude fitting into this topic isn't through generosity but rather through magnanimity, which means a, a type of heart that is very forgiving. A heart that is much more likely to forgive than to retain resentments and seek uh, revenge. And so Muqayyim says that here, generosity here is about developing a heart. Generosity within the umbrella or under the umbrella of good characteristics. It's about developing a heart that is comfortable with letting go of their rights. Their own personal rights. Someone comes and pushes you. Very rude, very mean. Now some people are going to, no, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to get up and punch the person. Now in Islam, that in of itself isn't sinful. That that this, the avenging oneself. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, uh, if someone is done wrong, then they are allowed to uh, reciprocate that wrong so long as it doesn't exceed the, the, the initial wrong. And the Prophet also says this. Right? Um, but we're not going to say that that behavior is good manners or the best characteristics, let me put it that way. Because when we look at the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ never reciprocated harm that was done to him. You know, I mean, especially in the Meccan era, they threw the innards, the inner, you know, the, the, the organs of a camel on the Prophet ﷺ as he was, um, as he was uh, praying. And Abu Jahl, uh, took the intestines of a, of a camel once and choked the Prophet والسلام, as he was in sujood, I believe. And so many other things. The hypocrites and how the hypocrites were always attacking the Prophet والسلام. I mean, they tried to assassinate him. Yet we don't know, or at least I don't know of, a, of an incident where he avenged himself. The only time Allah, the Prophet والسلام, punished someone or hit someone or attack someone is as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha describes that the Prophet sallam's hand never hit someone. Right? He never hit someone unless it is a had fi hududillah, a, a punitive measure of the sharia, meaning that a person did a crime that is a punishable offense by our sharia. So the Prophet sallam executed that not in, to avenge himself but rather to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for he is a prophet and that is his responsibility. And number two, fil jihad, when he was in war. But even when you look at all the battles the Prophet ﷺ participated in, there is not, as far as I am aware, the Prophet ﷺ did not directly kill a single person. Not one person. The closest he got to killing someone was one time after the battle of Uhud, 
he took a spear and he threw it towards um, a, a Qurashi who was kind of mocking the Muslims and whatnot. That spear didn't hit the person. It kind of hit the helmet, the side of the helmet. The person later passed away due to some sort of, I think, some like a heart attack or something like that. Because um, when the Prophet ﷺ threw that spear, it seems like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in that person's heart so much fear that it caused the person a heart attack, what we, what we would call a heart attack or a siege or something like that, and then he died. Right? But as far as I'm aware, the Prophet ﷺ's hand never killed a single person. <clears throat> so when we look at generosity, it's important to understand these terms, the way Islam defined it, not the way that we see it in the West or in modern times. A, a forgiving heart is a generous heart. Um, where, but if they are forgiving for their, of their rights, when it comes to the rights of other people, they put a lot of effort in preserving those rights. You see, sometimes what happens is the person is a very forgiving person. But that's not necessarily the result of generosity, but rather a type of weakness. The person isn't strong socially, for example. Right? They don't know how to deal with these situations. It's okay. It, it doesn't mean the person is a bad person or, um, or an insignificant person. But you know, we differ in terms of our social skills and our uh, ability to deal with other people. So a generous heart, when it comes to good characteristics, is a heart that is forgiving of one's own rights, but puts a lot of effort, the utmost effort, in making sure the rights of other people are preserved. And if someone's right is transgressed, uh, they will interject, intervene to protect that person's rights and to restore it for him or her. Uh, and this characteristic, this generosity, according to the way we just defined it, this is the kind of the general or the leader of good. A person who has this type of heart will have a heart that will easily embody the good characteristics that we aspire towards. Because someone who is able to forgive other people when they transgress his or her own right is someone who will easily be able to deal with arrogance. Is not someone who ha is a show-off or um, is, has a, a high opinion of, of him or herself. So what you find is that this type of, this characteristic does wonders for removing the very negative characteristics that we don't want in our hearts, like arrogance and ostentation and, and others. I also, if someone's willing to forgive their own rights, you know, we have dignity. We as human beings were created with dignity. No one likes their dignity to be stomped on. But if someone has the maturity to let go of these things, right, then they'll have the, the, the maturity to let go of some of their money, to let go of some of their desires for the sake of Allah, to let go of a lot of things which are necessary in order to do good. So that's the second one, generosity. And finally, number three, as-sabr, patience. Why? Because patience serves as a tool to preserve the previous two. How so? Seeking knowledge is a difficult task. Why? Not because reading a book in of itself is difficult, but rather knowledge requires consistency requires sacrifice and it will cause frustration so a person cannot reach a good amount of knowledge except through patience period and anyone who has sought knowledge overseas you know they will tell you this because it took an immense amount of patience to deal with homesickness to deal with being a foreigner to deal with a second language to deal with a different culture, to deal with a different lifestyle. We go from America, which has a high level, high quality of living, to these different parts of the world, you know, some of which are classified as, as you know, third world country, uh, countries. I mean, that's a huge drop. You have to deal with the people there. It's not exactly pleasant to deal with 
you know, I will say from my experience with the people I dealt with and when I was in Jordan. Hey, going from, some, from, an, from, an, from a land where everything is done via mail or the internet, where customer service is a huge part of business, to an area where the employees who are, meant, who are supposed to be there to help you could care less about you and will just kind of blow you off at any given chance. It requires patience. Also, knowledge doesn't just sit in your mind. Knowledge needs to be refreshed or else it will be lost. And so knowledge can only be reached through patience. And, and thus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the, the prophets, He said, He made them into imams, into leaders who guide humanity to, to guidance, who help humanity reach guidance and reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but only after they were patient. And thus, in order, to, uh, in order to gain knowledge and in order to retain it, we need to have patience. And the same thing goes for generosity. Dealing with other people requires an immense amount of patience. And so it might be easy to forgive your rights the first time, the second time, the third time. But if the same person keeps you know, uh, doing you wrong, you're eventually going to snap unless you have an immense amount of patience that is working to keep or working to or helping you retain that generosity. Um, also, patience is one of the greatest assistants uh, um, a person can have in this life and one of the greatest rewards we can, retain, uh, we can earn in the afterlife. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَىٰ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ And uh, assist yourselves or seek assistance from Allah through patience. Meaning by being patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises to assist you. And so those who are able to live patiently, to deal with life patiently, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them glad tidings and saying, I'm going to be with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, give glad tidings to those who are patient. Glad tidings of what? You know, glad tidings of an immense amount of reward, glad tidings of Allah's assistance, among other things. So if we truly want good manners, then we need to recognize that we will only retain it, we will only reach it through patience. And we ask Allah to give us the you know, tawfiq to do that. وهو على ثلاث درجات الدرجة الأولى أن تعرف مقام الخلق um, oh, I'm sorry أن تعرف مقام الخلق وأنهم بأقدارهم مربوطون فتستفيد بهذه المعرفة ثلاثة أشياء أمن, الخ... أمن الخلق منك حتى الكلب ومحبة الخلق إياك ونجاة الخلق بك So the first level of خلق is to recognize, to know the reality of the creation, to know the level of the creation. Now, Abu Ismail has spoken about this point in a previous station. And essentially what it's saying is the following. When we deal with other people, we need to deal with them for who they are, as if who they are is not in their hands as if who they are is dictated by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if we don't understand this properly, it can lead to some theological problems. So I'm going to reiterate and make sure that uh, what I'm saying is clear. When we deal with other people, right? now the, perspe the perspective here is I am engaging someone else. The perspective here isn't why this person is the way they are. But rather, when I deal with them, how do I deal with them? I deal with them as if this is who they are and they are kind of forced to be that way. It's not their fault. Okay? Now, what Abu Ismail is not saying here is that people are predefined, their actions are predetermined by Allah and therefore they're not accountable for their actions. That's not what Abu Ismail is saying. Okay? Abu Ismail is only looking at 
how, what kind of perception should we have when we engage other people? A perception that will help us uh, obtain and behave with the best of character. How do we do that? Well, when I look at the other person as kind of this is who they are, and it's not their fault. That is a very lighter perception of the person than saying that this person is intentionally doing these things. Two very different perceptions. Okay, so for example, when an intelligence, and say the FBI is going after someone, the perception they need to have is this person is intentionally doing it. And the perception they need to have is that this person is guilty until we see otherwise. Why? Well, because they need to catch the bad guy and the bad guy is going to plot and to plan in order to fool the, the police or the intelligence in order to get away and do crimes. Okay? With that perception, they're always on guard and they're always looking at every single angle. Now, I'm just giving an example here. I'm not saying the FBI are the most just people. They don't do anything un unjust or anything like that or controversial. I'm just trying to give an analogy here. Okay, that is one way of seeing people. And by seeing people this way, there's, it will create how we, or will determine how we are going to engage them. When the police assume that this person who's in custody is guilty until proven otherwise, they will interact with that person in a particular way. They're not going to be kind and, hey, what's up, unless that's a way of extracting what's in the person's heart, right? Whereas if I look at this person as innocent, even if I know he's guilty or she's guilty, right? That is a very different way of seeing things. And that's going to determine a very, or cause a very different reaction to that person. When it comes to akhlaq, what Abu Ismail is saying is that we need to be like the second one. I assume this person is an innocent person, even if, well, I, even if I see them doing wrong. Right? Again, um, this is within the boundaries of my own rights, not the rights of other people. So if I see someone as mocking me, ridiculing me, uh, trying to transgress my rights, I continuously make excuses for that person as if that person is being forced to do what he or she is doing. Um, why? Because by doing that and by perceiving other people in this manner, we benefit three things. Three results come about. Number one, amnul khalq mink. That the creation will be protected from you. Why? Because if I th see these other things as being coerced into it, I'm not going to attack them. In other words, if someone comes to you, right, and they're attacking you and they're trying to harm you, but you know there is someone behind this person with a knife saying, if you don't act this way, I'm going to stab you. Are you going to blame that person for attacking you and saying those things? Or are you going to blame the one who has the knife to his or her back? Are you likely to forgive the person who's, who's speaking ill to you? Most likely, yes, because you know that this person is being coerced. Does that make sense? Yeah, no? Half, half? Okay. It falls into my own personal rights, not the rights of other people. I understand where you're coming from. Sure.
Right, but when they do it to someone else, right, that is when you, it is part of akhlaq to step in and stop the person. The idea here, right, what I think Abu Ismail is, is, is saying is that, um, is that when it comes to yourself, how do, how do I put this? Now, I understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. Maybe we could discuss it after the uh, after the, the, the session, okay? Um, but just to continue, continue here. So you have three benefits. When you excuse other people okay, for their bad behavior, you are sparing them harm that might come from you. In other words, someone who will avenge him or herself. Right? Someone who will retaliate. Right? It is very likely and it's very possible that when the retaliation occurs, it goes beyond what is allowed. And so one harm leads to another harm. Whereas when we become more likely to forgive the other person, to excuse them, then at very least we are protecting the other person from the evil within my own self. To the extent that even a dog will be safe from you. In other words, when we develop this characteristic, it's not just other human beings who benefit from it, but rather all of the creation. So that's the first benefit. Number two, وَمَحَبَّةُ الْخَلْقِ إِيَّاكِ and it will lead to uh, the creation loving you. Because when society sees you as a very forgiving person, as someone who does not retaliate to protect their own self, right? to protect their own rights, uh, their own dignity, let me put it that way, then they will see this person as a very generous, kind, forgiving person. And in societies, such a person is, is actually elevated in status. So, f for example, um, one individual who I heard a story from said that uh, he, he's a religious individual who does a lot of da'wah, and he went to a young, a young man and started talking to him about Islam, come to the masjid, it's better for you, there's an afterlife. And this young man is, is one of those, you know, arrogant, um, not well-behaved individuals, and he spat on this person. Now, this isn't a young, another young man who's talking to him. This is an elderly man with, with a gray beard. So you know how in our societies, I mean, that's very bad to, for a young teenager, for a teenager to do something like that to a senior. I mean, that is very bad. So he spat on the beard of this elderly man. And what did this elderly man do? He went like this with his beard. He wiped the, the, the spit off and then went, went like this with his face, right? And when this teenager saw it, his face turned red and he did not know what to do. And so he kissed the guy's hand and said, I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. Right? Um, this is what Abu Ismail is trying to get at. Right? When this old man could have retaliated, and if he retaliated, he would have retaliated with the utmost right to do it. Not just Islamically, but also culturally. No one would have blamed that elderly man for if he were to have retaliated. No one would have. But he did not retaliate. And as a result, this young man remained safe. The, the elderly folk could have went to this person's parents and said, your child did this. Right? But he didn't. So that, that, yeah, the teenager... Uh, was safe from any harm, was spared any harm. Likewise, the action of the elderly man earned the love of this teenager. Why do we love the Prophet ﷺ so much? Because of how much he forgave. Right? Um, and then finally, the third result of this is bik. The creation will be saved through you. Now, if this teenager theoretically speaking, 
were to have remained the way he was for the rest of his life, then his afterlife wouldn't be so good. But because of the generous action, the generous, the generous act of this elderly folk, this young man was saved in the afterlife, inshallah. Because afterwards, he became a religious person who prayed five times a day, who went to the masjid, he fixed himself. But in fact, we, can't, we shouldn't say he fixed himself, but rather the actions of the person, the elderly man, fixed him. So he was saved as a result. So that's the goal here. When we act with good behavior, or if we want to reach the level of akhlaq, of good characteristics, then a huge part of it is reframing, rewiring the way we perceive other people and how they behave. And the more effectively we do that, the more we will bring about these positive results. Less harm will go on. When you look at these mass shootings, I don't know if you heard about the one that happened in Orange a few days ago. And what happened in Orange a few days ago? What was the case? Right? There was a disagreement in business. Right? Now, I don't know the, the details here. I'm just going to use it as a kind of analogy. Right? Let us say that what if they behave differently? Would that have happened? What if the business owner, and I, I, again, I don't know the details here, so don't say that this is what happened with this case, but let's say, what if the business owner was more, well, applied more good characteristics with this individual? Perhaps it would have stopped. It would never have happened before. And so the good characteristics would have protected the transgressor. It would have earned the respect. Likewise, it would have saved them all. That's the idea here. Reframe the way we see other people. And stop. One of the biggest mistakes I see is that people expect more from others than they do of their own self. And I find this so often in marriages, especially in young, young individuals, young couples. They expect more from their spouse than they are willing to do for their spouse. That's not the way life works. It's not the way life works. And so one of the advice I give to new couples, younger couples, is do not expect from your spouse something you're not willing to do for him or her. And that will help rewire, reframe the way we see the other person. And lower the expectations. Lower the, your expectations of other people and increase your expectations of yourself. That is a foundation for good characteristics. And then Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi goes into 12, or I'm sorry, 10 uh, observations, 10 mashahid. Uh, when it comes to I'm sorry, 11 observations. When it comes to what the person endures from the bad behaviors of the other of other people. Um so in other words, when we look at other people and their bad behavior, bad behaviors, these are 11 observations that can help you deal with them. The first one is what Abu Ismail mentions, and that is the mashhad of al-Qadr, the observation of the role of Qadr in their behaviors. In other words, when someone harms you, this observation is telling you that that harm came to you by the will of Allah and by His adjudication and by His decree. And therefore, we view this, um, we view what we have endured from another person as similar to heat and cold. Do we go around saying, oh son, how dare you make it hot? You know, when it's a hot day outside, do we want to seek revenge from the sun? 
when it's nighttime outside, are we going to go to the moon and say, how dare you not give us more light? We don't do that. We don't behave that way. I don't think anyone does unless they're, you know, they're going through some problems. Why not? Because we see the sun and the moon as inanimate objects that are nothing more than the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how we created it. And so there's nothing to blame there. Similarly, when we look at other people's bad behaviors as being part of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then when they harm us, when they make us feel uncomfortable, it's no different than a hot day and how it makes us feel uncomfortable. Right? When it's a hot day, do you get all frustrated inside and oh, I want to stop this, I want to change this? Not, not, not really, right? Yeah, it, we feel uncomfortable. We say, oh man, I can't wait till summer ends or I can't wait for the winter or I can't wait till it cools down, right? But we don't get, we don't get eaten inside as a result. So if we view the poor behaviors of other people towards us as being kind of part of the system of qadr, then at least it will prevent us from becoming eaten inside. Because when a person wants revenge, it eats them alive. It eats them alive. It bec their entire life becomes, how can I get revenge? How can I get revenge? They forget about their own self, their own interests, their own aspirations. Why? Because they want to get revenge against this person. And so it leads to absolutely no good. Um, and the idea here is that when we observe the poor behavior of people towards us from this angle, the least we get out of it is that we, we, we find a sense of tranquility inwardly. We're no longer bothered by what other people do. We relax inside. And that in of itself is a huge uh, bonus. The second observation is Mashhad al sabir is to observe what goes on with through the lens of patience. And that patience is to an extent an obligation. In fact, patience is an obligation. An obligation, why? Because patience, the, the primary goal of patience is to prevent us from doing that which is haram and to continue to push us towards doing that which or fulfilling that which is an obligation. Um, and patience will allow us to get off the track and off the path of reciprocity and revenge. Right? If I am patient with the, well, how the person is dealing with me, their poor behaviors towards me, then I don't feel the need to reciprocate their poor behavior with poor behavior, nor do I feel the need to avenge or get revenge against this person and harm them. So when we deal with these moments with patience, it leads to a better outcome. The third observation is Mashhad al-Afu wa safih wa al-Hilm. And that is the observation of pardoning and overlooking and forbearance. So patience will at least restrict us from doing that which is haram. But patience doesn't necessarily bring about forgiveness. A person can say, okay, I'm going to be patient with what you are doing. I'm not going to get revenge, but I ask for my rights on the day of judgment. Or the person might go and might make dua against the person. They're being patient, but they're not being forbearing. They're being patient, but they're not pardoning. They're being patient, but they're not forgiving. Okay, so the third observation is to be forgiving, forbearing, and oh, and. Uh, uh, pardoning. So we view these situations from these from the lens of these characteristics. Now it's very difficult to do that. Again, we as human beings we have dignity, and we don't want our dignity to be stomped on. However, in order to really get around that, we need to put to heart the following hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says. ما زاد الله عبدا بعفو إلا عزة. That whenever someone pardons, then that will only lead to further dignifying that person. Meaning, when a person pardons someone else, then Allah will ex will increase the person's dignity. ما زاد الله عبدا بعفو إلا عزة. 
Allah will only increase a person's dignity when they pardon. You see, the problem we have is we think that if we pardon someone else, then other people will say, oh, look, you know, look, at that's, that's too bad. The person's weak and whatnot. This is a big problem. So a lot of times what happens, especially in our cultures, it's not about, it's not just about preserving my dignity, right? But rather, how are people going to see me if I don't do anything in response? You know, for those who, who remember basketball back in the, the 90s, when Shaquille O'Neal and these guys were, were all there, maybe you remember this. But one time, uh, Charles Barkley um, threw the basketball at Shaquille O'Neal. You still have the clips here. Uh, if you don't understand, if you don't know these or don't remember these people, then don't worry, the, the idea is here. Um, so Charles Barkley threw the basketball at Shaquille O'Neal's head. Shaquille O'Neal turned around, waited a second, and then threw a punch at Charles Barkley. Right? And 20 years later, they kind of ask him about this because now both of these people host basketball shows and whatnot, right? and they're friends, and they always joke with each other. So they asked him about this moment, right? and they, he, Shaquille O'Neal said that, I knew if I didn't retaliate that I would never be able to enter a barber shop ever again. What, he, what does he mean? Now, the barber shop in, in, in uh, African American or black cultures is a big thing. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a social setting. What he meant is that people will see him as a coward and, uh, and weak for not avenging himself. So he attacked Charles Barkley, not because Charles Barkley, you know, did something really bad or hurt his feelings or anything like that, but because he was thinking about his own reputation with other people. So this hadith comes and changes that. When we forgive, when we pardon, then that will only increase Allah's love for us. It will only enhance, so to speak, Allah's opinion of us. And as a result, Allah will put this feeling, this opinion in people's hearts. And remember, why the Prophet ﷺ is so revered to Muslims is because of these attributes. Why is he such a beautiful person? All right, why did he have such a beautiful heart? Kind of wink, wink, you know, a beautiful heart. What we'll be talking about through, through Ramadan, inshallah, because of this. Um, also, when we pardon and forgive and, and uh, forbear, it has an ability, it has an effect on the heart to where it brings a type of joy and pleasure to the heart. And it makes the heart feel noble. It has this effect that I had control of myself. I controlled myself. I control my actions, not my emotions. I chose to forgive that perception makes the heart feel dignified, feel noble. This is the way Islam views pardoning and forbearance when people harm us. Allah Ta'ala Adam, let's stop at the fourth observation. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.